Um, I was just telling Aruna, I, I think the first time that I became aware of her was actually on social media, where I was following this thread and um, suddenly this woman came in and, you know, you only have a certain amount of, of uh, words to pay attention. And she so concisely, you know, came up with this argument that I was like, oh, that's what I would have said if I could have been that concise in my words. Um, she is amazing. She's the author of the book Whitewalling, Art and Protest in Three Acts. If you have not read it, I implore you to read it. Um, it's a very important work that looks at three moments, um, I kind of talked about at the begin, beginning, um, over the last 40 years where, um, and I'll let her talk about it a little bit more, um, <laughs> where artworks or exhibitions have not quite done what they should have done, but they've also helped us to have this wonderful dialogue. Um, so without further ado, Aruna. Thank you, Dimitri, and thanks to you and all your colleagues for inviting me to take part in a day that's really um, been filled with the voices of people that I follow and admire and learn from all the time. So it was, it's been a real honor, and um, it's been a fab fabulous discussion. Um, so I'm going to throw a curveball now because I'm not actually going to take you all through the argument of uh, whitewalling, um, uh, it, but I want to talk about some some bigger issues. One of the guiding questions that Dimitri sent us for you know the panels um, was who has the right to confront issues related to Black experience through art, and I wanted to go back to that because. If I change that question a little bit, who has the right to confront issues related to black experience through art writing and art criticism, that has been a very big issue for me as I <coughs> sat down to write a book that tells of the history of black protest, tells of the history of resistance to the kind of um, uh, assumptions that guide uh, the often the mission guide the practices of historically white art institutions and really draws upon the um, often unrecognized theorizing of black protesters um, over the course of several generations. And so I've been very aware of the fact that I've been doing this as a non-black woman of color, and um, and it's uh, very much been on my mind and was uh, brought again to my mind uh, earlier this week when I gave a talk at Otis College of Art um, in a room that was almost entirely white uh, at a school that has very few, although it has very many important um, grad black graduates, um, uh, you know, some of the great black contemporary artists, including Carrie James Marshall, including David Hammonds, uh, there were no black faculty members in the room. And I was asked in the question period after I talked about this book that I've written, um, not asked, I was told, um, by one of the few black students in the room that I should not have accepted the invitation to speak, nor should I have written the book that my um, that that um, I should, as an ally, be making space for um, by by seeding the platform, which is something that I have a great deal of sympathy for. I have a great deal of sympathy for that position, and it was surprisingly, and I told this young. Um, student, uh, this this young activist, really. I told her at the time that this was a question that, or a challenge that I had been expecting since the moment I decided to write the book. Uh, but it was the first time I'd actually gotten it um, in uh, in a talk, and I was I was interested in thinking about it. And I think that there are a lot of um, ways of answering the question, uh, but I really realized that what I would have liked to do in retrospect, um, 
in, you know, in the moment I talked about uh, questions of institutions and I talked about questions of power and I talked about questions of allyship and responsibility and foregrounding um, the voices of, uh, you know, of black activists in my narrative and all of those sorts of things. None of those felt very satisfying. And so I decided on my drive up from LA to San Francisco that I'd like to talk a, a little bit um, about my uh, my work um, and my position in relation to this question of who has the right to confront issues related to the black experience, to black experience through art, um, as a way of holding myself a little bit accountable to the, to the communities and to the discourses that I hope to serve through my work. So. I started as an art historian. Um, I got a PhD and I became a professor. And about six or seven years ago, I decided to leave academia. There were a lot of reasons for it, but um, one that I always told myself, I, I always came up with different reasons for my decision to leave academia. But the one that I kept coming back to was that I found it hard to reconcile the idea that so many of my fellow academics, that the, the idea that so many of my fellow academics have, that our work is somehow political when so little of it translates into transforming how universities operate to create and produce the inequalities we rail against in our intellectual work. Um, the breaking point for me, I always seem to have a breaking point before I make big life decisions. And the breaking point for me was the Penn State football scandal. The, um, uh, and for me, I realized, wow, all of those committees that rubber stamped and gave, uh, you know, covered up and gave permission for this to happen included faculty members. And I was like, okay, so what sort of industry am I working in? And maybe this isn't the industry that I need to be in. I was no different than my colleagues. Right, as a professor, I would talk about race, class, and gender in terms of 19th century and contemporary art. But I had no real idea, especially when it came to race and class, how these forms of oppression were structuring and determining the lives of my students every day. I remember with shame the encounters I had with students at the mostly public universities at which I taught. The blindness which, with which I imagine the barriers some of them experienced, the ignorance about the financial and social constraints that prevented them from turning a paper in on time or staying awake during class. It was arrogance, pure and simple, and I still blush because of it. This was all accentuated, my feelings of having failed in some very fundamental way at what I value most about myself, in other words, my capacity for empathy and understanding, because my decision to leave academia co coincided with the murder of Trayvon Martin, an event that ushered in what, what, what is going on six years of heightened activism around state-sponsored or state-authorized executions of unarmed black people. As I began reading more and more about the ways in which white supremacy has been institutionalized in the U.S., and I should say here that I'm Canadian, and so for me this was uh, very much a kind of um, dawning historical and cultural understanding that I did not grow up with. As I began reading more and more about the way in which white supremacy has, in, has been institutionalized in the U.S., including Ta-Nehisi Coates' The Case for Reparations, a devastating account of the ways in which the consequences of slavery didn't end with emancipation, but rather continued over generations to strip wealth and therefore the capacity to access the very basic rights and institutions that we all take for granted from black families. I began to feel my failures as a professor more acutely. At my best moments, perhaps, I did nothing to make the situation worse but I could point to very few ways in which I had actively worked to undo it. I realized I didn't like who I was as an academic. I wore the mantle of intellectual authority poorly. It accentuated all the wrong parts of me like a dress that doesn't suit my figure. So I decided to leave and become not an art critic, but a writer. A writer of what I did not know yet. 
I wanted to find a landing spot for myself where I could think of writing as the production of finished, not as the production of finished ideas, but as a sandbox for working out thought, allowing ideas to remain in play, where judgment could be suspended in favor of weighing ideas. I wanted writing to be a form of brainstorming, of posing questions rather than asserting answers. Art criticism was not an obvious place to land, given what I wanted from writing. Though there are many ways to be an art critic, many voices one can take, judgment is kind of baked into the form. I had to think about how to do it without slipping back into old bad habits and with the awareness that my political commitments to racial justice required that I could not speak from a comfortable position, that I had to put myself at risk in whatever way in order to make a positive contribution, contribution to change. When I say risk, I speak in a modest way. I'm not talking about the kind of risk that people, the people on the front lines of Black Lives Matter protests take. I'm not that brave. I mean the risk involved with pushing myself out of my comfort zone, with making myself and people around me uneasy, which I'm actually pretty good at doing, with prioritizing doing the right thing over doing the easy thing. I was also trying to figure out how to take seriously the lessons that I had learned from reading Coates' The Case for Reparations. That after generations of stripping wealth and power and therefore education and health and jobs and security and freedoms from black Americans, those injustices had to be paid back with interest. Not simply by giving blacks what whites now enjoy, but making up for atoning for what has happened over the past hundreds of years. Now, obviously I don't have the power to ensure actual reparations for the descendants of slavery, but I am a fan of analogy, of trying to figure out how to make the seemingly impossible, the seemingly impossible work on a small <laughs> but still meaningful scale. I don't have the capacity to pay actual, to offer actual reparations, but I do have the capacity to imagine what a reparative mode of criticism should be or could be. I should now preface what I'm gonna say by saying that my imagining is just that. I don't think I've achieved it. But I know what I want to strive for. This then is my working plan for a reparative mode of criticism, which I've been trying to think about and practice for a little while. First, while I don't have the financial resources to make actual reparations, I can devote the resources I have to make up for my own past inadequacies when it comes to historicizing contemporary art. By paying attention to art practices and art histories that I had previously overlooked, or when I didn't overlook, framed in a way that did nothing to disrupt the overriding whiteness of my historical narrative. That doesn't mean for me giving black artists and artists of color equal time as of this moment forward. It means making up for my lack of attention in the past. So for me, this is meant writing primarily about African-American artists and, and artists of color <coughs> and indigenous artists. This decision, which, I've never said, which I never said out loud when I came back to art writing, so after I left academia, I became a food blogger for a while, and then, and then I did a whole bunch of other different kinds of writing, and then I came back into art criticism about two years ago, a little over two years ago. So when I came back into art criticism, I never sort of said this out loud, figuring it would be too self-congratulatory to announce it, and that I didn't want to be that person. And I'm thinking back to Naima's talk about the announcements by these various museums of, you know, doing the right thing. And I didn't also, didn't want to get editors hackles up in advance, right? Um, but eventually it became clear to people. Unlike black critics, who are infuriatingly and unjustly, more often than not assumed not to be able to write about or speak to any issues that do not involve race or black artists. And I know people in this room have experienced that. 
My propensity to write about non-white artists was treated as a questionable choice. Are you sure it's not limiting yourself is a question that I often get, even just in the last few weeks. I decided that until black critics were treated in the art world as a matter of course, to be able to speak on any topic, on any artist, on any issue, which of course they can, they just assume not to, I actually didn't or shouldn't have a choice. If I was understood to be limiting myself, both in an intellectual and a professional sense, by writing about, frankly, the most interesting artists and thinkers working today, then I would limit myself and take the hit. Why should I exercise the privilege of breath that my black colleagues often do not have access to? Second, since I was now delving into writing about art that I had because of my own failures of curiosity and education, little context for, I would have to ab abdicate any position of authority or judgment, the traditional voice of the art critic and write as a student. That means for me putting most of my effort into understanding the work on its own terms. My goal would be to draw attention to work that, in my mind, was teaching me how to be an ethical and political citizen of this fraught moment in history. I rarely criticize in my published art criticism. I criticize a lot on social media, but not in my published art. I am, the, I am of the belief that one should only punch up, and I am increasingly aware, aware that despite my own sense of powerlessness, both because I genuinely have very little of it and because I don't really want the power I have, it is too easy to forget my privilege. So I conceive my role as an art critic, perversely, I'll admit, as to be more akin to signal boosting practices that I think are worth looking at and thinking about than in criticizing as such. Third, and this goes along with assuming the position of a student and writing about things that I don't know enough about in order to learn from them, I would learn how to talk about my own failures as part of my practice. I think I had primed myself for this task by writing my food blog which, though it dwelt on many different themes, spent a great amount of time narrating my failures as a now ex-spouse and parent, not as an exercise in self-flagellation or spectacular martyrdom, but in the hopes of modeling forgiveness, including self-forgiveness, growth, and empathy. I wanted to be an object lesson, the subject of a grown-up after-school special. Learn from my mistakes, people. Be better than I was. I was convinced that our culture is enfeebled by people's inability to admit when they've done something wrong, when they've hurt someone, when they've failed. It feels sometimes like saying sorry is understood as a sign of weakness. I have always believed that it's a sign of strength. At one point, I convinced myself that I should be hiring myself out to politicians to write their apologies because I write a damn good apology. <laughs> I had to put my commitment to the test in the wake of the Jimmy Durham show, which I had reviewed for a publication I write for called Four Columns during its run at the Hammer Museum. This was my first foray writing about the work of a Native American artist, and I relied on the show and the catalog to frame not only the art, but the long rumbling controversy surrounding it, a controversy based on questions of the artist's claims to Cherokee heritage. When, or claims or not exact claims to Cherokee heritage. Um, he, was notori he is notorious for um, blurring that uh, specificity. When the show moved to the Walker Art Center, protests by Native American curators and scholars gained traction. In a Facebook group, I had begun in a fit of peak in the 2015, when a white New York Times art critic lamented to me, to my face, that there were no people of color in the art world, to me, to my brown face. Uh, the group is called Binders Full of People of Color in the Art World. Um, the issue of Durham's identity claims, <laughs> The issues of Durham's identity claims and the question of how or whether to reframe his art practice in light of the challenges to those claims was heated. 
I, who had already gone on record praising the show and downplaying the rumblings, took the not so great, but perhaps not surprising position of defending Jimmy Durham so as to justify or excuse my own recently stated critical position. I found myself with plenty of company. I was one of the scores of non-Native American art worlders who had suddenly become experts on tribal affiliation, blood quantum, and so on, based on five minutes of Googling in the heat of a Facebook argument. <laughs> But thanks to the many, many Native American members of that Facebook group, I didn't know how many until that moment, who patiently but firmly explained the issues so that even I could hear them, I realized that I needed to say something new. That new thing would not be any adjudication of, jury, of Jimmy Durham's right to claim himself as a Cherokee. That was, to say the least, not my business to decide but an examination of my own resistance to enter, entertaining the possibility that this canonical artist might not belong in the canon, or at least might not belong in the canon for the reasons that he was put there in the first place. When I published the piece called Mourning Jimmy Durham, which took as its conceit working through the seven stages of grief involved in reframing one's own personal history of art, I was surprised when someone on another Facebook thread, this time on Jerry Saltz's Facebook page, called me hypocritical for first praising the work and then, after the protest became louder, stepping back from that praise. This person saw my willingness to change my mind as a sign of my refusal to take a firm stand, of my inability to stick to my convictions. I understand why it might, be, why it might have been understood that way. Our critics are often expected to assess work from a position that is above the capricious ebbs and flows of momentary debate, especially in the outrage-fueled spaces of social media. One takes a risk of being misunderstood, changing one's mind, learning from one's mistakes, making one's mea culpas, abandoning, admitting one's biases is easily seen as hopping on the latest bandwagon, throwing one's lot in with the mob, blowing in the wind. I get that. I don't care. Fourth, it would require not just writing about different subjects, but writing for a different audience. We, those of us who have gone through art training in whatever form as curators, as, as art historians, as, as art critics, are often trained to write assuming a generic reader. At best, um, something like someone intelligent and informed, but who reads at a sixth grade level and is not a specialist about art, or something similar. And at worst, someone who has read the top 20 theory texts on my reading list, or someone who knows the ins and outs of Cezanne connoisseurship debates, or whatever. But I know that at least for me, I never once questioned, asked, what the race of that generic reader was to be. And if I did ask about it, I probably would have had to recognize, admit, that I assumed that my generic reader was white, that they looked like the people who surrounded me in my classes, in my grad school, in my, you know, institution when I was a professor in the art world, uh, the spaces that I was um, spending my time in. So well trained in the workings of white supremacy was I, that even as a brown person, I imagined my default audience didn't even look like me. I've spent my whole life, in other words, reading art writing written for a male, for a white gaze, and writing it as well erasing my own subjectivity along with that of others in the process. I learned so much from that writing, even if I wasn't acknowledged in it. So what would happen, I thought, if I tried to write for a different gaze, a black gaze? It wouldn't mean that white readers wouldn't be able to read and learn from it, just as I could learn from writing written for a white gaze. In fact, it's likely that no one but me would notice the change in perspective, let's face it. 
But it would mean that by centering in my mind a black reader, I would not only have to write in a much more mindful way when it came to issues of race and politics, but it would mean I would be able to assume a shared knowledge of certain concepts like the existence of structural racism or the phenomenon of white fragility or the weaponized use of white tears. Instead of feeling obligated to justify my use of such well-established analytical frameworks, I could start at the starting line of my analysis instead of 10 yards behind it. It would be the responsibility of readers not familiar with my language to get up to speed, not mine, as a subaltern voice to translate myself. Now, once again, this is my goal, not my achievement. It's an ongoing challenge with editors at the many publications I write for who are overwhelmingly white and so do demand explanations or worse, justifications of things that I think most POC readers would take in stride. And it is an ongoing challenge to myself to make sure that I've done my homework and that I am not, God forbid, non-black explaining to my imaginary black reader their own experience. In setting this as a goal, I have to open myself to the possibility that I will get it wrong, that I will be called out for it when it happens, and that I will learn to listen to the criticism and try to correct for it. Fifth, I would try to combine the two things that I love most, both the close read and the nuanced description of the things I see when I look at an artwork, and the bird's eye view of the institutions, power structures, and systems which frame everything we do as artists, curators, critics, historians, and viewers. Not necessarily in one piece of writing, of course. I haven't quite figured out how to make that fly yet. It would be a form of art writing that understood that there is no aesthetic understanding unless there is structural understanding, political understanding, economic and social understanding. Whitewalling is a foray into art criticism that doesn't actually really analyze a single work of art, that makes, among its many arguments, a claim that we cannot begin to see any work of our art outside those determining factors, and that any claim that we can do so needs to be suspect. All of this adds up to something that doesn't look like much, doesn't look much like art criticism at times but I still muddled through trying to find a voice that I feel is adequate for this terrible and terrifying world we live in now. One filled with injustice and the everyday violence of anti-blackness by state and citizen alike. I don't know if this vision I have of a reparative mode of art criticism is useful to anyone but me, if I'm getting it right, or even how I would, it, how I would know if I'm getting it right. I think the only way that it could be considered successful is if over time, those voices that have been ignored, that those practices that have only found their way into institutions um, and, in art, and in magazines as a form of diversity and inclusion, rather than a real structural transformation of our institutions, a decolonization of them, were to move fully to the center of those same institutions or better, if new forms of institutions grew in their place. My success as an art critic will be in my voice becoming less important, not more, as other writers so long prevented from having such platforms take over. I work for my own obsolescence in the end. Until then, I work to hold a space for a different kind of artwork. doesn't strike you all as too indulgent to talk about my work like that, but I, I'm, I'm trying to take very seriously the idea of um, a kind of critical transparency um, and making clear the, the, the assumptions that operate behind my work. So, anyway. Are there any questions?
Yes. Um, I really appreciated the discussion of the process of transitioning from one commercial identity to another. Yeah. What was, how do you, how do you structure an academic uh, career to be, you know, writing towards, you know, I know you talk about the sandbox book, but writing towards this other direction of complete freedom and you know, more than an inordinate amount of self judgment? <laughs> More than an inordinate amount of self judgment. I, I, um, I, so uh, working outside of an ins institution, I'm, I'm a terrible employee. I'm, that's just, <laughs> I've known this from the start. I'm, I'm, I'm bad. I, 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 I don't like being in institutions. Um, and which is not to say I don't like working with institutions or I don't like, like studying institutions or I don't, love the people who are in institutions. I just, I, it's very hard for me because I don't see institutions as more important than people. And part of being in an institution is believing in the institution um, and believing in its mission and believing in the st structure. And I often don't feel that way. I often see the ways in which institutions are um, as much good as they do the ways in which they're limited. And so I get I start speaking out of school and I get in trouble and then, you know, whatever, it's a disaster. Um, so part of the reason that I, that I decided that I was in a position to do the work that I'm doing now is precisely because I'm not beholden to any institution. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I, I sort of, um, the other thing that what I'm terrible at being in, in institutions, I'm really good at burning bridges, and so <laughs> part of, part of part of my part of the work, and I think part of what I, I think the thing that I'm proudest of with whitewalling is that I actually do something that I think is hard for anyone who works within an institutional space, even the space of academia, which conceives itself as sort of semi-independent from a lot of these things, right? Especially because, you know, if you have tenure, you know, there's a certain protectedness, although we know now with, for many um, black and POC professors that tenure isn't necessarily a, um, a actually fully protective. But even with academia, um, you know, there's, there, it's hard to name names. And one of the things that white whitewalling does is it actually doesn't speak around uh, racism. It actually names names, and it allows people. It it puts it it attaches the words um, to the people who wrote them in ways that are, I think, um, were hard to write because a lot of times they were these were words that were coming out of the mouths of um, people who had been my teachers and my mentors, but who actually said some really shitty things. And so um, I, I think that it was only because I'm, I'm, I conceive myself as operating outside of institutions that I, I was in a position to do this work that I think a lot of people who are trying to transform institutions from within, whatever kind of institutions, just don't, they, they can't and shouldn't risk, right? So anyway. Um, but other than that, it's it's great. I don't have to deal with um, teaching evaluations or <laughs> faculty meetings or whatever. I get to do the stuff that I want to do, which is think and write. So. Yes. Thank you so much for uh, your talk and sort of get on a lot of things I think about in my institution. Yeah. And, uh, my name is. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but, you know, thinking about the idea of power and objectivity and how that produces truth. Yeah. And would you like to talk about like the the extent um sort of um thought of formalism and how that sort of maybe if you're looking through things the formalist lens that produces white supremacy and anti blackness in particular. Well, I think that I think that, you know, one of the things that became really clear looking at um the the various protests, right? There, so I talk in White Walling, I talk about three protests. One was the 1969 protest against Harlem on my mind, um, on, uh, for which I drew heavily on the work of Bridget Cooks um, and her excellent book, Exhibiting Blackness, which really was is, is um, 
game-changing um, in terms of thinking through issues of museums and race and protest. Um, the, the second one was a 1979 exhibition at Artist Space, uh, where a white uh, California artist um, went to Artist Space and titled his show using the most um, incendiary racial epitaph in the English language, right? And the third was uh, the 2017 Whitney Biennial and Dana Schutz's painting, Open Casket. One of the things that I that became clear is that we have all of this humanist language um, to talk about, um, you know, these ideals, right? These ideals for a kind of liberal democracy. And some of these ideals, that, you know, when it comes to larger questions, it's like freedom of speech and artistic freedom, right? It's an ideal, right? Freedom of speech is a kind of foundational concept uh, in, in liberal democracies. And, and, you know, when it comes, how that translates into the art world, we have questions of, of, of quality and pure art and, you know, all of these things. These are also like humanist concepts in a sense. And the thing that became clear is the way in which those concepts were not, are not often in liberal societies, used to allow people to enter discourse, but are used to police discourse, right? And so, for example, when the protesters against Dana Schutz's open casket began to, um, began to their protests, they were called censors, right? They were called, they were imagined as people who were suppressing this liberal value of free speech, right? Um, and there was no, almost no analysis of the question of who is granted that freedom of speech and who isn't, right? Um, in the case of the 20, uh, of the 1979 protest against artist space, and this was, you know, a protest that was um, the, the, you know, Howard Dean, Pindell and Larry Stokes Sims were very central to the protest. Harry Dinas Pindell said something so, you know, um, and Lucy Lepard was involved and Carl Andre was involved. He was, he was one of the good guys, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, he, he um, but, but Howard Dinas said something so brilliant and she said, you know, what's the use of talking about freedom of speech when so many of us are um, censored out of the system. Like we're not allowed in in the first place. So we don't, so no one's ever gonna argue about, I'm paraphrasing, I'm riffing, but no one's ever gonna talk about my freedom to say what I want because I'm not allowed in the institution in the first place. So like, you know, so all of these institutions that are defending freedom of speech are actually defending white freedom of speech. Right? And they're using their institutional power to defend white people of speech, um, uh, for white freedom of speech. And, and I think that, that those sorts of things become interesting. Now, like the formalism question, formalism and, and feminists, you know, and, um, you know, black uh, sort of critical race theorists around art have talked a long time, Lorraine O'Grady talks about it um, extensively in her writings, about the way in which um, formalism, that quality, right, that pure art, ideals of pure art and quality become similar um, policing, boundary policing things, right? You know, who, who's gonna argue against quality right, in art. You want to look at good art, right? But how we define those things obviously becomes extremely ideological, right? And um, and they become boundary policing sort of issues. And so uh, for me, it's always like, anytime someone says like, this is this is a, a good, we want freedom of speech. It's like, yeah, we, do, we want it, right? But like, you know, like who do we want it for? And who are we gonna protect it for? And whose rights are we gonna, you know? I just, um, there was a, the, the Women's Caucus for Art last Saturday, a woman named, Priya, you're gonna help me with the name, Gladys Barker Grower. Barker Grower, I always wanna mix up her last two names. A woman named Gladys Barker Grower um, 
received an award, um, a Lifetime Achievement Award. And um, Gladys Martha Grauer uh, was, uh, is 95 years old now. And she, in Newark, um, established a, a Black-run art gallery <laughs> that focused on women artists. And it was there to really support. She was an artist herself, but she was starting this gallery to make sure that um, her fellow artists, these other Black women working in Newark, didn't have their work subsumed by the needs of life, right? Home, husband, kids, whatever, right? And so she started this gallery, but she did a lot of work that was, um, uh, you know, public artwork that was focused on uh, black history and black uh, activism, black protest. And she was invited to, um, she was invited to make a mural in the, in the Newark uh, post office. And she made this mural. And uh, in the end, the curator who was in charge of the public uh, artwork program um, painted over the mural. And, uh, and we don't, we, we, you know, when we have situations like, um, and she took, she took them to court and she won a very important court battle, battle around censor, artistic censorship. When we talk about censorship, we aren't talking about artists like Gladys, whose <coughs> work around questions of race is being censored by public institutions. We talk about people like Dana Schutz, who has the power of the market, of her dealers, of her collectors, of, uh, the, of the Whitney Museum behind her, right? So, the, so that, the unequalness of that conversation becomes, to me, really um, crucial to recognize and to say, anyone who tr now tries to say to me, like, you know, these protesters are trying to shut down conversation. I'm like, no, they're trying to have a conversation you might not want to have, but they're not trying to shut down a conversation, they're trying to start a conversation, right? So how do you change that perspective and get people to like actually see it as a form of speech and not a form of shutting down speech, right? One more. Um. Okay. So when I look at the brochure, yeah. when I saw your photograph, I said, what is this person doing in this form? Yeah. And I, I'm trying to understand it. Given your um, academic achievements and credentials, and you're saying that you need out of them, yeah. my question is, having one of those and these other specialists in state of mind, yeah. What I'm doing here? Well, I mean, I started by saying, like, you know, the last talk I gave, I got a lot of pushback from one person, and so, and and I expect that. I I think that, you know, I think that there's a degree to which often um, people may not be saying it to out loud or to my face and and I recognize that that might happen. I know that what I'm what I have tried to do is in in as much as I have control over is when people ask me to um, speak I am I try to be in conversation with people um, so that I'm not um, just you know, giving a talk, but that I'm actually like asking people to, to making space for for people to for other people who have more to say, in some cases to talk. Um, but I also part of part of the not the criticism that I write, but the, the this particular book um, was a project of saying things so that other people wouldn't have to. Right, seeing that something was wrong in the world, which was that the protesters, all, all, many of whom were very young, uh, professionally precarious or vulnerable, not all, but some, most, many, um, 
black artists, critics, writers, um, had put a tremendous amount on the line by staging the protest um, and seeing that they were being treated as um, as people trying to tear the art world down rather than as people in the art world trying to make their voices heard. And so this was a way, and since so much of this was happening on social media, which is a very transient space, um, for me it was a, a way of kind of putting these things down and getting, taking them out of the space of social media so people could see that the major thinkers on this issue were young artists like Parker Bright and Pastiche Lumumba and Aria Dean and, you know, Hannah Black, obviously, and, and a whole bunch of other people. So for, for me, um, it, was, it was hopefully doing the, doing the work that I thought was like the, dir the dirty work, right? The, the work that I didn't want to have other people to have to do because I wanted them to be able to do their own work. Um, and and not have to serve a largely white audience by telling them what they should have been able to see from in the first place. So you know, so yes, I do. I, I haven't gotten much pushback, um, but you know, it's it's early days in a certain sense, and the pushback may be there, and I'm not hearing about it. So you know, there's that possibility too. All right, well, thank you guys all so much for joining us today. I want to invite you um, to continue the dialogue after this. Moab stays open until 6. Um, please, please, if you have not had a chance to go see all the artwork, um, please take a lot of time <laughs> to really enjoy and take this in. Like I said, it's very, very comprehensive. Um, and please consider joining Moad as a member. All right, thank you so much. Like, I, she, I know she's like, she's got, but she's totally got the knee. <laughs>